Really, the, the truth is that uh, I invite to, to break the mood because after that beautiful music, what I'm about to do isn't, isn't really that beautiful at all. So I want to tell you, there's, there's, there's really two things that I'm going to talk about this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. But I'm going to talk a lot about this. We can just we can just leave that here till the end. So picture this. It is the weekly gathering of the Portland Juggling Club, and dozens of jugglers at all levels of ability have gathered, as they do every Wednesday night, in a dingy gymnasium to practice their juggling skills. At one end of the room, in the same place he stands every single Wednesday night, is Ben Schoenberg. Ben is a world-class juggling talent and he is practicing, as he does many weeks, juggling 10 balls. 11 is the world record, and he's juggling 10. And what he does is, so he picks up five blue bean bags in each hand, throws them up into the air, catches as many of them as he can, lets the other ones hit the floor, and then he gathers them up again and does it again, drops, gathers, does it again, and he'll spend most of the two hours doing that. And then at the other end of the room is Jean. Jean is a freshman math major. There, not because she's interested in juggling, but because going to the juggling club is a highly recommended semi-requirement for math majors. Jean is a brand new beginner and is learning to juggle three clubs one of the most elementary juggling tricks there is. She gathers up the clubs, hurls them into the air, catches the ones that she can, lets the others hit the floor, then regathers and repeats. And that's how she'll spend most of the next two hours. So there's Ben, world-class expert, and Jean, the beginner, This morning's sermon deals with the subject of forgiveness, and it occurs to me that many sermons about forgiveness begin with the preacher describing unbelievable and almost unimaginable stories of people practicing forgiveness at the Ben level, at the world expert level. Forgiveness practiced like that, like we saw in South Carolina in June, one news report wrote, as Dylan Roof, the gunman who killed nine people inside a church in Charleston, South Carolina, appeared in court on Friday to formally hear the charges against him, representatives of the victim's families came forward to deliver a powerful message of forgiveness. You took something very precious away from me, a family representative, For Ethel Lance, the 70-year-old grandmother who died in Wednesday's massacre, told Ruth on behalf of Lance's loved ones, I will never talk to her again. I will never be able to hold her again, but I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. You hurt me, you hurt a lot of people, but I forgive you. Forgiveness practiced at that world expert level. Or this story. In Florida... Renee Napier and Eric Smallridge appear together at a high school assembly to talk about the dangers of drunk driving. The two are an unlikely duo. Eric, after all, was the drunk driver who killed Renee's daughter in a car accident. Now they rally around a common cause of preventing tragedies like these by speaking together. Renee says of Eric, I could be angry, hateful, and bitter, but I won't want to live my life that way. 
There is no way I could move on and have a happy life without forgiving him. She says that she's come to love him and his family and considers him like a son, even lobbying for his prison sentence to be reduced by a decade. Forgiveness practiced at that world expert level. Or I think about in the Christian tradition, the seven last words of Christ, those uh, which refers to the seven sentences which, according to the Gospels, Jesus spoke on the cross. The first of those seven last words, those seven utterances, is nothing less than an urging for forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. That, too, is forgiveness on that world expert level. And so many sermons on the subject of forgiveness talk about heroic and extraordinary examples of just unimaginable forgiveness such as these. What are we to do with these stories? And isn't the implication that if these impressive acts of expert-level forgiveness are possible, as practiced by Jesus and by Gandhi, by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, by the saints in Charleston, doesn't that imply a challenge to us about all the ordinary, everyday things we don't manage to forgive? And even the petty and picayune stuff that we continue to hold against others. The times that someone insulted us or ignored us or took us for granted. The times when we were sorely disappointed. The mistakes made by the people who are supposed to love us the most, our partner, our children, our parents, our siblings, the grudges that we hold, the times when we didn't get what we wanted, the times someone let us down. All those things, I'm sure that each of us could make a list, not bend the juggler 10 ball level stuff, just gene the beginner elementary stuff. The Jewish holy day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, begins on Tuesday of this week. According to the Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, marks an opportunity for turning. And during the ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's said, the tradition tells us, that the Book of Life is open and your name may be inscribed in it for the upcoming year. But in order for this to happen, there is a need first to be purified. And so these holy days are marked by acts of teshuvah, repentance and turning, atoning, apologizing, seeking forgiveness. The idea is that this is a time for unburdening oneself so as to be able to start anew. A traditional Jewish interpretation of why Yom Kippur occurs so shortly after the Jewish New Year is that it is evidence of God's mercy that God is leaving the door open longer for those who need to atone and seek forgiveness. The book's not closed on the new year. There's an extra 10-day grace period. I have a slightly different, maybe more cynical and more sardonic interpretation for why Yom Kippur occurs just 10 days into the Jewish New Year. I think it takes about 10 days for almost everybody to have already done something that they need to be forgiven for. It's a reminder that try as hard as we might to be perfect or blameless, we will inevitably all do something for which we need forgiveness. It's a happy coincidence, I think, that Yom Kippur occurs early in the fall each year. But even if Yom Kippur fell fell during some other time of the year, I'd still preach about forgiveness early each fall. You see, by the time mid-September has rolled around, there have already been mistakes made for which forgiveness is needed. I'm sure that even though our kickoff of the church year was just a couple of weeks ago, there are already emails that I've left unanswered, people I've disappointed, toes I've stepped on, and projects for which I had high and lofty hopes that are barely getting off the ground, if they've even been launched yet. And so I need to say, if you've already found me unresponsive, or if you're feeling disappointed or bruised, I apologize. 
And at the same time, I'm reminded of that old saw. The art of ministry is disappointing people at a rate that they can handle. (laughs) And I'm reminded of the aphorism we read at the beginning of the service this morning. It's certain that I will step on your toes. It's certain you'll trip over my feet. This is called learning to dance. So I have to say that there's one particular place in the life of the church where I'm actually feeling a need to kind of confess and disclose and ask for some forgiveness and maybe even ask for some intervention. And that is uh, in the planning of the auction, which is now only five weeks away. This is part sermon, part advertisement here, by the way. You see... And I have to tell you, I have to confess what, what I, the attitude that I brought into this, because you, you bring to any new thing your own experience. So here is, based on my own experience, watching up close as 11 auctions were, were planned, here is kind of the expectations for how it goes. The theme of the auction would be a catchy play on words, but really of little importance. It might not even get mentioned the night of the auction. Decorations would be modest, if there were any. Entertainment, if there were any, would be planned pretty much the day of. Food would be potluck, of course, because that's the only way to do it. And the auction committee would probably consist of a half dozen people, at most, likely fewer. And they wouldn't hold any meetings, because they never do. And then the auction somehow would raise about $35,000 on an off year. It's the way it was done. And sometimes more than 40000 And it would just sort of happen. So I looked at the auction here with, with its goal of raising $12,000 and thought, easy peasy. And in doing that, I confess that I First of all, grossly underestimated how much work it was. But more than that, much, much more than that, I discounted the traditions and expectations our church has around what an auction is supposed to be. So I'm feeling the need right now to kind of apologize and ask for forgiveness and also to ask for help. For forgiveness and for help. That's like a double swallowing of pride here. Forgiveness, that if you've suffered any anxiety about how it'll turn out this year, I'm sorry. If you've volunteered and gotten something that you was totally unlike what you expected, I apologize. And I'm coming to discover that money is not the money is not really the, the big deal, even if we're the auction work to kind of like come in like way bad. It's I could easily like cut a check and make up the difference but it's the relationships that are more important, and I don't want anyone to wind up coming away with a sour feeling. So I need your forgiveness in advance. Some things this year are going to feel very, very different at the auction, but it's going to be great. That's the way it may be this year, but that's not necessarily the way it has to be every year in the future. So things will be different this year. I need your forgiveness for that and your understanding, and I also need your help the help of your open mind and the help of your generosity of spirit, the help of your donations, the help of your donations. The donations are open online, and uh, you're a talented and creative bunch. There's already some great things, a wonderful bluegrass evening um, where bluegrass music and, and a wonderful party. There's, there's all, sorts of, all sorts of things. So forgiveness and it'll all turn out okay. At the very worst, at the very worst, it'll be an exercise in forgiveness and not Ben-level forgiveness. It'll be three-ball-level forgiveness, I hope, unless I've misunderstood this all. In the Christian tradition, there's a passage about forgiveness in the Gospel of Matthew. In the text, Peter approaches Jesus and asks him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? Should I forgive as many as seven times? And Jesus answers Peter, not seven times. Seventy times seven times. 
It's a challenging passage, isn't it? Who else finds the idea of forgiving someone over and over and over again, up to 490 times? Who finds that a little bit difficult and challenging? So here's how I interpret this passage. What I'm pretty sure Jesus is not saying, I'm pretty sure Jesus is not saying, is to keep track of everyone who has ever wronged you, everyone who has ever slighted you, keep a tab going, number it. And then when you have a list of 490 complaints, that's when you can stop. You'll no longer have any need for forgiveness after 490 times. I don't think it's a literal 70 times 7. I think what Jesus is saying is that forgiveness is hard, and that it's hard, but it also that it takes practice. And that while forgiving probably can never be perfected, it requires diligent exercise for us to get better at it. One forgives by practicing forgiveness, like one practices juggling. One practices juggling by picking them up and dropping them, picking them up and dropping them over and over again. And forgiveness works the same way. Forgiveness works by saying, forgive, I forgive you, and then doing it again and again and again until it all works out. You can't do it just seven times. It takes 490 times or 49,000 times. In our opening words, Leslie Takahashi writes, When will we remember that forgiveness is not so much an act as an attitude, not so much a duty as a love we give ourselves over and over again as part of an ever-unfolding new beginning? Feminist author and Jungian analyst Clarissa Pinkola Estes writes, Forgiveness seems unrealistic because we think of it as a one-time thing that has to be completed in one sitting. Forgiveness, though, has many layers and many seasons. It's not all or nothing. Forgive 95%, you're a saint. 75% is wonderful. 60% is great. Keep working at it. Keep playing with it. The important things, she writes, are to begin and to continue. And what I'm proposing here really is a work-like attitude towards forgiveness, a work-like attitude towards forgiveness, that it's not something that the experts of forgiveness just walked into a gym and, and could juggle ten balls or forgive something unimaginable. It was something that was a practice, starting with the small stuff, maybe with the easiest stuff and working up. Buddha, it said, was asked, how do I attain enlightenment? And Buddha answered, easy, chop wood, carry water. And then when the person came back and said, how long do I need to do this? Buddha said, keep chopping wood. Keep carrying water. A theologian by the name of Lewis Smedes wrote, Forgiveness is letting the wrong live in its own time. Letting the wrong live in its own time. By which he means the, the past. Letting the wrong live in the past rather than in the present. However, I think that the work of forgiveness since it is unceasing since it is a practice that one practices over and over again. It requires engaged work. With that, I say amen and thank you.